Hello and welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Maria Ressa. Today we talk about Lee Kuan Yew and the Singapore he leaves behind. Joining us from Hong Kong is Singaporean author, academic and writer, Cherian George. Uh, he has Fan, he's got three books. Uh, one of the titles I love, Singapore, the Air Conditioned Nation. Uh, and a quote that I love also, Cherian, um, about Lee Kuan Yew, uh, <laughs> pulled out by the New York Times just now, which uh, talked about Lee Kuan Yew as a combination of, of uh, awe and fear. Is that right? Charisma and fear. Charisma that, yeah. and fear. That's right. <laughs> so, so tell me, I mean, what, what is the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew, Cherian? Well, I think, uh, you know, I could be very academic and say we'll only know in 50 years' time, right? But I guess that won't suit uh, a news organization like you. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, try some punditry instead. Um, I mean, I think, you know, what is very clear is that he put Singapore uh, on the winning side of late 20th century history. Right? Uh, you know, he recognized, I think, you know, well before um, other nationalist leaders, uh, maybe you know, 20, 30 years ahead of his time, right? Uh, he and his team uh, recognized uh, the way the wind was blowing. This is uh, a, a world that is going to be dominated by globalization. A small country like Singapore doesn't have a choice. You just have to play that game and not try and invent a new game or not try and opt out. Maybe bigger com countries have that option. Singapore doesn't. So he realized, uh, you know, in the 60s right, that uh, the, the way forward for Singapore was to be open and he made sure Singapore played that game very well, you know, what it means to be relevant in, uh, in a world dominated by uh, global capital. And, and because of that, he put Singapore on, I think, on a, on a very firm footing. Uh, it raced ahead of its uh, Asian neighbors, you know, and that, that advantage, that material advantage is still is something that we'll enjoy and probably will endear for another generation. You said charisma and fear. Explain that. Uh, well, the fear part is obvious, right? I mean, that's one of uh, that's a key part of his brand. Uh, it may be uh, harder to remember from where we are now, but you know, I think most Singaporeans grew up, you know, with the, with the knowledge that uh, if anyone crossed him. Uh, you know, that would be a price to pay. Uh, if uh, you crossed him as a political opponent, um, and if you challenged the government's authority in, in a way that he regarded as too irresponsible or too out of control or too radical, the cost could be detention without trial. And there were many political prisoners that were put away for uh, months or even years, uh, uh, many years. Um, for, for most Singaporeans, that fear translated to, well, I mean, he kept his civil servants on his toes. And I think that was one good thing about the, the fear factor, right? Uh, you know, he made sure that uh, public servants really worked for the public, right? uh, which meant zero tolerance of corruption, but also, you know, a real attention to detail. Uh, you know, public servants and even fellow ministers, you know, while he was in prime minister, lived in dread. And I think actually that of course is good for citizens, right? Correct. And and maybe and that's why maybe uh, you know most Singaporeans uh, um, stomached his uh, his bullying tactics even towards them because they knew that he was not going to be soft on the people working for the citizens. And I think that made a big difference. You know, it it, it meant uh, a Singapore system, um, a Singapore establishment that uh, you know really emphasized getting things done. Yeah, uh, so that was a good side to it. The, the charisma part of it, uh, well, you know, th th there were times when um, logic and argument ran out, when uh, when debates were unresolved, and in the end, how did he get his way? Well, yes, partly by fear, but also just by the strength of his personality. Right? I mean, that there were times when Singaporeans would follow because he acted like a leader. And I guess that by definition is, is charismatic leadership. It took 30 years uh, to move Singapore from the race riots of the 60s, mm -hmm. the opium dens, even that, that river that had to be cleaned up of clutter to this futuristic city, uh, the seeds of this kind of futuristic city we see today. Uh, what is it, could it have been done without Lee Kuan Yew? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, in some ways, maybe his individual contribution is overstated. Uh, 
for example, I think even within, you know, among PAP historians and within the establishment, uh, you know, there's an acknowledgement that wait, you know, he actually wasn't the economic architect of Singapore's progress. Right? Uh, he had an extremely able and brilliant uh, uh, finance minister, come deputy uh, prime minister named Go Keng Sui, who really was the economist of the team. Uh, he had a small clutch of extremely gifted uh, senior civil servants who really were the economic technocrats. Uh, he didn't have as strong an economic brain as they did. But, you know, he did have, uh, number one, you know, a very clear sense of where the world was heading yeah, mm -hmm. in terms of geopolitics and so on. And the other thing that the team relied on him to do, and this is what historians say, is that, you know, he cleared the way for them, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he knew that um, uh, no matter how strong your economic brains, no matter how strong your technocrats, uh, you know, they could get uh, obstructed and sidelined by politics that's too noisy and contentious, you know, inconvenient things like active trade unions or meddling press and so on, right? So he made sure that the politics was streamlined, yeah? that, that, uh, that uh, these economic planners, urban planners, uh, could make long-term decisions uh, in the interests of society without having to worry about short-term uh, inconveniences like, you know, public opinion and the mm -hmm. press and so on. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I think that was his role. He, he, he uh, created a political environment uh, that, uh, in which uh, you know, good government uh, had a chance and had a shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would say that uh, without him, uh, you know, I think many of the economic policies would still have been correct, right? but maybe not as uh, efficiently put together, maybe slower and so on. Um, over the last few years, though, I, I would say starting <coughs> the general election in 2011, for example, right, you could see that this now was a different generation and that Lee Kuan Yew may have been a leader for the generation before and that Singapore was ready for something new. Is that correct? And, and, and how do you see Singapore moving forward now? Well, yeah, that's a, a complex uh, question, maybe more complex than it seems, and uh, I guess many layers, right? I mean, uh, I think one thing that I'd like to say is that, look, Singapore would be changing with or without Lee Kuan Yew around, right? Uh, it is just a different world, a different population. Uh, there's no doubt that the kind of Singapore that we had in the 70s and 80s was an anomaly, you know, a, a PAP that, uh, you know, ruling party that monopolized power. Uh, that wasn't going to last. You know, at some stage, Singapore will become more normal. Right? And what we're seeing now is the normalization over a long period of Singapore politics, becoming more contentious, you know, people being harder to please, you know, issues being harder to resolve, mainly because a lot of the things that Singaporeans want now uh, are not uh, your bread and butter issues. You know? they're, they're not uh, so uh, simple, such simple needs to meet, or rather such uh, basic needs to meet. Uh, so, of course, the country was going to become more contentious politically, with or without Mr. Lee. Uh, did uh, Mr. Lee become out of touch? Uh, I, no, I hesitate to say that because um, it, I think that there's some um, uh, views that he had that were kind of idiosyncratic, right? I don't even think they were, they were essential to his own uh, policies of fundamental beliefs. For example, he had this very odd belief uh, in intelligence being inherited uh, and uh, you know he was an uh, he was an academic elitist with a very very narrow view of merit yes yeah um, <clears throat> which he stuck to till the end yeah, yeah. Uh, that I think did hold Singapore back and and I think Singapore uh, was has already come round to understanding that you know merit and talent has to be defined much more broadly yeah and that's already underway. He also had rather strange views about race, you know, that uh, were not really necessary to the Singapore system. And these also were unshakable. But I, I don't think it's correct to remember him as uh, entirely dogmatic. Yeah? Uh, you know, on the contrary, in recent years, there were uh, important debates in which, you know, he showed that he was actually more progressive than many of his colleagues. He was one of the first cabinet ministers uh, to, uh, to say that uh, you know, leave gays alone, you know, it shouldn't be criminalized, right? Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and many of the uh, current cabinet have not come round to the, his position on homosexuality yet. You know? yeah. So he was actually ahead of the curve as far as homosexuality is concerned. Uh, 
uh, even um, on the big decision to allow casinos. I mean, that's yeah, quite correct. remarkable. That's a you know, con switch, con complete switch. Exactly. Considering how uh, much of a you know a hardliner he was about moral values in the past, you know, here was a prime minister who, in the you know, I grew up remembering um, uh, signboards in government offices or outside the post office saying males with long hair will be served last. I mean, I wouldn't have an issue to him for obvious reasons, but, you know, but <laughs> that was how, um, uh, how uh, adamant he was about keeping Singapore free of hippie culture, yeah. right? Yeah. So he had these strange rules that showed this really moralistic streak in him. And yet this was the prime minister, I mean, so he was then in the left cabinet, who looked at the numbers and said, you know, Singapore is looking for new ways to make itself attractive. He came out and said, yeah, the, the logic of having uh, two integrated resorts with casinos, he can't fault it, go ahead. And you know this was a decision that made literally made at least one cabinet minister cry in parliament during the debate. That was how much uh, how emotional it was. Uh, so it is uh, you know it's not uh, historically correct to think that he was retarding progress on uh, all fronts in uh, in, in in significant ways. Uh, he was um, I wouldn't say at the cutting edge, but you know he was not as conservative as some can, uh, might seem. So, you know there's there's even a quote from him um, saying that. Uh, he didn't really see the point of censorship anymore. Things are into life is things. Things are too open. Yeah. Uh, you know why bother to censor movies anymore? Why bother to censor the internet? The world has changed. The rest of the cabinet hasn't come around to that position. Yeah. So he was ahead of the ahead of the curve. Extremely adaptable. He is. <clears throat> I mean, what Singapore has accomplished in is the best in the region, a central provident fund, uh, no homeless, uh, no corruption or little corruption. Um, a lot of these things are things we only dream of, subsidized public housing. Well, what do you call it? The HDB, the Housing Development yes. Board, right? Uh, at one point up to more than 80%, 84% of Singapore's people own their own homes with yep, government yep. subsidy. Right. These are things we can only dream of in countries like mm -hmm. the Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, one of the things that, that struck me when I was living there in 2011, though, is there really did seem to be a, a, a generation now that wants more and a, and a government that doesn't quite know how to give that. Uh, is that a, a fair perception? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the, definitely people's needs and wants have evolved. I'm not sure whether they, uh, you know, uh, these new needs for you know a better cultural life, more work-life balance, you know, for more uh, you know interest in heritage, for example, right, uh, the finer things in life. Whether these are uh, would even now be vote winners, I, I doubt it. Uh, you know, certainly they uh, concern Singaporeans. Uh, certainly, you have many Singaporeans willing to spend money or their time in these pursuits, and they care deeply about. Uh, uh, these these new issues, you know, these more lifestyle concerns, you know, values, identity, and so on. But would they be enough to sway votes? I, I haven't seen the evidence. You know. I, I still think that the 2011 election, when the People's Action Party suffered uh, its biggest setback ever, Correct. not great by international standards, but still, you know, a significant slide in its votes, um, that these boil down, again, to the basic economic issues. Right? This was a, a country that had gone through three recessions since the last, uh, uh, since the previous election, um, that had a government that had made some policy uh, missteps, not in terms of any of these new issues like you know, freedom of the press, nothing like that. Policy missteps in the, uh, in the areas in which uh, it considered fundamental, like housing, hospitals, transport, and so on. So the basic things it was getting wrong, and that was what it was punished for. Um, so I think uh, we, it is too early to tell whether, uh, come the next election, you know, if the government manages to tweak these basic policies, whether it will continue to suffer. It may not. It may have already done enough to convince Singaporeans that, yes, uh, you know, uh, the government has gotten the message, uh, it's uh, going to address um, affordable public housing, transport, and so on. If you were to define then his legacy now, how would you say it in a succinct manner? What is the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew? Oh, um, I, I would put, uh, you know, his uh, zero tolerance of corruption uh, probably as number one. Yeah. 
simply by looking around the world at how many countries uh, you know have their good intentions shattered by public officials who do not work for the public but for their own pockets yeah. Uh, so, so that has become part of Singapore's political culture. It will be with us for a while, uh, at least another generation. And I, I, I will put that as number one. Uh, secondly, uh, a certain public sector ethos, very closely related, you know, uh, that uh, anyone in public service has to work hard for the people. Uh, it's high up there as well. And a basic sense of fairness um, that we owe to one another. I mean, I do consider, I mean, Singapore does have a problem uh, in terms of its income divide yeah. um, and so on. But I would still say, you know, having, knowing many Asian countries, you know, I, I would stick my neck out as a loyal Singaporean and say that Singapore is probably the least feudalistic country in all of Asia. Yeah? Uh, we, uh, we abhor extremes of wealth and poverty we do not consider them natural. We have a large middle class and we are uncomfortable with the idea of extreme poverty as well as the idea of extreme wealth. Um, so I, I think these are, these are this, there's a certain self-respect among Singaporeans, a certain uh, dignity we accord one another that I think goes, uh, you know, it can be related to the way uh, Lee Kuan Yew carried himself and expected his country to be treated. You know, I mean, one of the ironies of um, uh, the, the Lee Kuan Yew government is that on the one hand it is uh, one of the most westernized uh, uh, governments in the world, right? I mean, he, he had no problems keep making English the national effective, the you know, de facto working language of the country, uh, in spite of this being the language of the colonists uh, and so on. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, this did not make uh, Singaporeans as, uh, say, pro European or pro American. American as many other uh, yeah. countries in Asia. Yeah? Um, there, there is a certain um, uh, self-respect that Singaporeans have that I think uh, you know is uh, is yeah. one of the less right. tangible effects of Lee Kuan Yew's Correct. Yeah. government or yeah. rather his own style, because he demanded that despite being the leader of a small country, he was going to be taken seriously on the world stage because sovereignty matters right, as a small independent country. I think that is rubbed off on Singaporeans. Yeah, absolutely. So Cherry and, uh, you know, hit Lee Kuan Yew's son is now the Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Loong. Um, he has had to fill big shoes of his father. It's, it's living under the shadow of his father as the founder of Singapore. Um, how would you assess him as a leader and, and how has he performed against this huge towering figure? Well, um, I think, you know, that uh, contrast is probably getting less and less important because don't forget there's a generational uh, thing as well going on, right? I mean, uh, for anyone under the age of uh, 40, uh, you know, Lee Kuan Yew is more of a distant historical figure. You know, they didn't grow up with, you know, memories of him, you know, hectoring them, uh, you know, in TV appearances and so on. Um, and, and so they, they don't, that, that comparison isn't even really in their mind. So it's only those of us who are a bit older who remember Lee Kuan Yew as Prime Minister, then uh, make a contrast with Lee Hsien Loong. Uh, he is a very different leader, different style, not as, uh, uh, not as all controlling, I suppose. Uh, believes much more in decentralized government. Many people think too much so. Um, the, uh, uh, so, so I think that comparison becomes less and less relevant. He, I mean, it, it could be said that he's a better leader for the times. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, isn't it? The, uh, the, the, there are weaknesses for, uh, you know, in, in Lee Sien Lung's style as well. Um, so. At least up until now, did they benchmark themselves against Lee Kuan Yew? Or was Lee Kuan Yew really... Uh, the senior minister was he the mentor minister, uh, and and he was above, and everyone kind of led from where they were. Uh, so, do you mean the uh, Singaporeans as in within the establishment? Or? Yeah, the Singaporeans. Now, I mean, imagine if you're the leader in your own country, but there is the founder there. Are you always compared against him? I suppose is he the uh, benchmark of leadership in Singapore? Right, right, right. right. I think. Uh, He's not necessarily a benchmark because I think most Singaporeans recognize that, uh, you know, times have changed. You know, those were unique. Uh, that was a unique situation in which he was governing. Uh, you know, nobody wants that same style to, uh, you know, to be reborn in any new leader, right? Uh, 
Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, one interesting thing that has happened over time and that should be a concern for Singapore is that, uh, you know, th this uh, pragmatic um, ideology, that's a bit of an oxymoron, right? But yeah. the pragmatism of the first uh, generation of um, uh, Singapore leaders, in a way, you know, th that was at a time when they were looking for answers, yeah. right? And, and the pro one of the problems that we face now is that, uh, uh, you know, Lee Kuan Yew as well as his successors, by the late 1990s, I think they figured that they had found the answers. Yeah. Uh, and a kind of a new dogmatism set in after that. Uh, and in fact, nowadays I would not describe the current government as pragmatic. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, uh, quite dogmatic on many issues in a way that I think uh, hurts them uh, as a ruling uh, party as well as it hurts the country. Um, so there is that kind of unhealthy benchmarking where, you know, uh, certain fundamental truths that, uh, that Lee Kuan Yew, um, uh, you know, uh, came to and sort of codified in his memoirs are now regarded as some of the immutable truths of Singapore. Uh, that is probably uh, in unhealthy, and you know, I would say that it is one of the dangers to watch out for in Singapore. You know, have we reached a stage where there's a certain uh, groupthink in government uh, because everyone is um, uh, so overwhelmed by the idea of this uh, legacy? This was the this was the formula for success. Correct. Uh, you know, uh, you know, for in earlier generations. So you know, we are extremely reluctant to tinker with it. It has worked in the past, uh, so uh, let's not fix it. Yeah. So, so, and this was, of course, a burden that uh, Lee Kuan Yew during his prime ministership was not uh, so seized by, right? Because yeah. it was too early to tell whether things had worked. Correct. So, correct. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, his government was, I think, a little more open to. Um, uh, to arguing first principles than the current government. Interesting. So if you look at it as a startup, I mean, Lee Kuan Yew began a startup and now this is a huge successful company. Uh, we always yeah. say Singapore Inc., right? So he, it's a huge successful company. And, and the problem is then how will innovation come in when the very processes that made it successful are now the very same things that are holding it from moving quickly again and innovating? Um, Maria, I, that's that's a that's a great analogy, Maria. Can I steal it? If you can have it, but so, but let to continue that analogy. Uh, what do you see Singapore doing now? I mean, we still look at Singapore as a, as a hub in our region. Is it prepared to innovate? Politically, unfortunately, no. I don't see the. the um, uh, any encouraging signs, and and I would put it uh, this way. I mean, uh, l let's say we accept that Lee Kuan Yew and his generation were exception, exceptionally good and positive for Singapore. These were, in their own words, political entrepreneurs, and they yeah. really were, right? Yeah. Uh, if we accept that um, for the for a while the the PAP, uh, you know, is the answer to Singapore's problems. Then we've got to ask ourselves, and we've got to play this mental game. Okay, what if there is a group of young Singaporeans in their thirties, early forties, you know, uh, 21st century Lee Kuan Yew and his team, right? Yeah. With bold ideas, political entrepreneurs uh, who can really uh, produce a qualitative, uh, you know, improvement, a quantum leap for Singapore. Would it be possible for them to innovate from within? And, um, and the interesting thing is that the answer is no, structurally no, because the uh, Lee Kuan Yew created a party um, that cannot be challenged from even within. Right? Uh, the, the, the way the Central Executive Committee of the party is chosen, uh, you know, it's elected by a, a group of cadres hmm. who are selected by the CEC. <laughs> So it is it is actually uh, constitutionally impossible within the PAP uh, structure uh, for say a group of young Turks to say build up a local base and then you know fight uh, internal party elections and rise to the top uh, against the wishes of uh, um, uh, of the center of the party. Uh, so the only way to rise uh, to the top of the party let alone of Singapore. The only way to rise to the top of the party is to win the blessings of godfathers uh, who are the incumbents within the party. 
so this, of course, is not at all uh, healthy for, for innovation or regeneration of the party. It basically excludes the possibility of anyone um, as innovative, as determined, um, as entrepreneurial as Lee Kuan Yew um, coming up in the 21st century within the PAP. But there are so many ministers that I know who are extremely smart and with your 10-year plans that you have and the ability to shift it. Do you see any of that within the system? Are they, these are, the problems that Singapore is facing is now not just Singapore's problems, it's also global problems. The Philippines is at the forefront of the climate change issues. Uh, ISIS, well, Singapore doesn't have to deal with ISIS in the same way Indonesia, say, has to, but Jama Islamiyah found a, a, a place in, in Singapore as well. So do you see any of that um, in the existing government structure? Well, uh, I mean, the thing about uh, the government that we have uh, is, uh, you know, there are brilliant minds within it. There's no doubt about that, right? So they've got an ex uh, at the individual level, these are extremely capable uh, civil servants and ministers. Um, and, you know, um, sometimes we take it for granted as Singaporeans, but when we speak often to foreign journalists who come and meet them, you know, they would kill for government, uh, you know, for the quality of, of government in, uh, individuals like that back home. Right? Yeah. Uh, so th there's, there's no taking that away from them, right? So they're extremely able. Um, the the question though is, uh, what is it that? Um, uh, it's okay. Go ahead. Up. Okay. Okay. Um, so the the. Uh, the question is, uh, what does it take for an organization uh, to produce uh, great decisions and innovation? Is it really, uh, you know, Control. 10 outstanding, yeah. uh, outstandingly intelligent individuals, yeah. right? Yeah. Or do you need internal diversity? And again, I think you know, if you look at the business world or the, any organizational study, you know, they will tell you that you know, what's needed is internal diversity. Correct. It's better to have 10, 10 people who are brilliant in different ways yes. than, uh, than 10 people who may have the top IQs but are brilliant in the same way. Yeah? And I think that is Singapore's uh, the, the, the danger that we can see within um, the Singapore establishment right now. You know, we have uh, people of undoubted uh, uh, intelligence and brilliance, but they tend to be brilliant in the same way. Yeah? Um, so, so if the problems that we that Singapore is going to face uh, is going to be similar to the problems that it's been facing for the last 10, 20 years, uh, you know, if uh, nothing big and unexpected happens that is outside of the playbook, you know, then you know, Singapore will be fine, right? Um, um, but what if the problems are different? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what if you need uh, new kinds of intelligences to deal with the unexpected? Uh, then I think you'd have to worry about whether we are getting the best out of Singapore. But you know, uh, l let me moderate that by you know saying that I I'm not talking about a collapse of Singapore as yeah. a result of, of this problem, right? Uh, all I'm saying is that I think um, uh, a Singapore of the 21st century, uh, you know, five, six million uh, people, the highest education levels uh, in Asia, developed, you know. Uh, mature citizenry, I think it, it can actually do better than what the, the PAP thinks it can. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that that is actually more talent available than uh, than we think. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, well, I, I got to throw you one last question, which was okay. actually one of the first things you said, which is it, the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew is the zero tolerance approach to corruption. Uh, in countries like Indonesia and the Philippines, we dream of things like that. Do you see that Singapore experience being replicated anywhere else around the region? What will it take to make that happen? Uh, you know, I think we were just very, very lucky. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that um, you know many study teams come to Singapore to investigate our success with you know keeping Singapore clean, right? Uh, you know, and I'm sure that uh, Singapore tries to explain what works, yeah. But uh, I think one thing that is not on the PowerPoints that uh, our officials are showing is uh, just the, the luck we had in having a founding prime minister who was, in a sense, uh, above corruption simply because, you know, he, you know, frankly, didn't really have much of a taste for the finer things in life. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, uh, and you know, and to match that, you know, he had a wife with absolutely no heirs. Right? Yeah. Um, and and they raised uh, three children uh, who are, uh, you know, who are geeky more than greedy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> geeky so, more than greedy. And, and how many how many first families or you know can you point to in the world? Uh, you know, with that, uh, you know, where the country is lucky enough to have that combination. Not only a uh, essentially an incorruptible prime minister, but also an incorruptible family, yeah? um, uh, who, uh, they, I think they wouldn't know what to do with the money even if they had it. Yeah? <laughs> uh, I mean, other, you know, when, when Lee Kuan Yew wore, um, uh, he decided that the, that, that the PAP uniform should be simple, you know, shirts, these white and white pants to symbolize purity, right? I mean, other countries do that, you know, when they go out in the constituency, they try to look pure and humble and so on. But you know that in between uh, constituency engagements or public events, you know, they are shopping for Italian suits and you know, <laughs> fine leather shoes and getting into their fancy cars. No, but Lee Kuan, but Lee Kuan Yew, it wasn't, right? I mean, he was equally unfashionable uh, out of public <laughs> view <laughs> than within public view, right? I mean, he, he, when other people were wearing suits, he'd wear a wind cheater and track shoes. You know? Uh, so you know you can't. I think that that aspect has been underestimated, and you know I think Singapore is just extremely lucky that uh, you, we had a prime minister uh, who was uh, austere in uh, in his own life, and and and, every, and Singaporeans knew that. And so Singaporeans yeah. knew that when he was preaching to them about getting rid of corruption, there was no hypocrisy to it. Right? Uh, he had the moral authority to push it through from the very top to the very bottom. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, as you know, you know, once uh, corruption sets in, you know, it's, uh, is it possible to unroot it, especially once it seeps into the political process, you know, such that good people um, find it impossible to get Me? elected until Correct. they, unless they are tainted themselves, and then it's too late, right? Yeah. Uh, how, do, how do you do it? I mean, they're, they're still waiting for, you know, for a happy story, right, anywhere in the world. Well, on that note, the zero tolerance to corruption, that is a great legacy for Lee Kuan Yew. Cherry and George, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, you, you are on Twitter. Please continue to tweet questions at Cherry and George, and you can also uh, tag at rapper.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Cherry and. Thank you. Bye-bye.